just out of curiosity, how many of you have read the book? About half, okay. Uh, this is a controversial book. If you've read some of the online material, you'll know that there is a tremendous gap between a few of what I would call the establishment gatekeepers and, and everybody else, but it's quite a violent disagreement. Uh, the, uh, one of the questions seems to be not whether uh, I'm right or not, but whether it's okay to even talk about these subjects. Uh, and I'm hoping that uh, this evening we can talk about it a little bit. What I'm going to do is read a little bit from the book, but because when I've attended readings, I found it a little bit boring sometimes when people read too much. I'm going to try to not read too much, spend a little more time just kind of talking to you, telling you a few stories about how I got on the project. And then because the book is so sprawling, not attempt to cover uh, everything it encompasses, but rather just take questions and we'll try to see if we can kind of get a feeling for it. Uh, basically, uh, uh, you know, I've been thinking recently with the, uh, the financial meltdown and uh, the uh, continuing crisis uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan and every other continuing crisis that you can think of and every unresolved matter involving uh, documents on torture and new revelations concerning things that were happening under the Bush administration. Uh, I think we're beginning to understand that we don't understand. It's, we're beginning to realize that we don't really know how practically anything works. And one of the things that, that I discovered in doing this book was that I didn't understand anything. And this is after 20 years as an investigative journalist. I was just amazed at how little I knew on any of these topics when I started uh, drilling down a little bit. Uh, and uh, so the same thing is true about George W. Bush. I found how little I knew. Now, how did I get on this project? Uh, in 2004, 2002, 2003, 2004, I was living in the former Yugoslavia. I'd actually been asked to go there by the U.S. government to train journalists there in uh, how to uh, investigate their government and how to uh, uh, create a system of accountability. And while I was there was a run-up to the uh, invasion of Iraq and uh, I saw the popularity of the United States plummet uh, throughout Europe. And people began asking me, well, what's going on in your country? And I sort of felt a little bit like a hypocrite. Here I was teaching people how to make a democracy flourish, and I, there were so many serious problems transpiring at home, and what was I doing about it? So I left uh, the Balkans, and I returned uh, to the United States, and I set about a little mission for myself. With my meager savings, I began traveling around the country, simply asking the question, how do we explain the phenomenon of George W. Bush? How do we explain that this most improbable of individuals became not only the President of the United States, but really the most powerful person in the world? It, was, it seemed to me on its face sort of an astonishing thing. And I realized that everybody knew it was an astonishing thing, but few people seemed to care or talk about this, the very astonishing nature of it. Uh, and so I uh, uh, began traveling around, and I, I, I visited people in different places, and I would ask them, what do you make of this stuff? And, and I think that's maybe where I first met Jim Moore. Uh, I, one of the places I came to was Austin, and I remember sitting in the backyard of some bar and grill here with a bunch of journalists and uh, I think a few lobbyists and so on, and I said to them, well, what... Uh, uh, what's the deal here? You guys know Bush. What, what's the real story here? And I turned a tape recorder on, and it's, it's, I really ought to turn that into a, into a product because it's amazing. You hear all these di people saying completely different things. Everybody had a different theory to explain uh, Bush's rise and what it meant. Uh, but there was no consensus at all. And so uh, as I continued traveling around the country, I didn't know where to look, and I began sort of looking at all different kinds of things. Uh, one of the first things I, I focused on was George W. Bush's National Guard record. And I became interested in this because it seemed pretty obvious to me that there was something wrong with his record. Here was a man who was, uh, had started a purely elective war, and he was sending uh, uh, not only uh, uh, Americans into harm's way, but he was sending National Guardsmen, people who he had been in the National Guard back when being in the National Guard meant not going anywhere at any risk, and here he was sending other people who'd signed up for the National Guard expecting maybe to be uh, uh, piling up sandbags uh, during an emergency or something, but not to be sent to Iraq. Uh, and then we interviewed some of these National Guards people, and they told us they were very poorly trained when they went off to Iraq. They'd had only a few weeks of training. It was horrific, and they were really just sitting ducks. So uh, as I began looking at all of this, uh, uh, I, I, after I did the National Guard story, I began asking myself, uh, how do you explain George W. Bush? Uh, 
And how do you explain uh, uh, that this fellow could get to the top? And so as I began looking at him, what struck me was that he never would have been president of the United States if his father had not been president of the United States. And so I realized if I wanted to understand the son, I had to understand the father. And this took me on a kind of a crazy journey over these five years. And I want to tell you that some of the passages I'm going to share with you, which are I, I think truly astonishing, uh, which relate largely to the father, are things I discovered in the last, I want to say, year and a half or two years of my research. The first three years, I just looked at a lot of different things and didn't find very much. But when I found something, I went right down the rabbit's hole. And at that point, there was no turning back. Uh, one of the things that struck me about George W. Bush, you probably all remember this, was how different he was supposed to be than his father. You know, he was a real Texan. He was a, a tobacco-chewing, ch uh, cowboy boot-wearing. You know, the father tried to pull it off and couldn't pull it off, but George W. really pulled it off. And he was a real guy. You know, he'd, he, he was such a real guy that he'd had to uh, basically uh, uh, have a religious conversion in order to become uh, a person who was acceptable to his, his voting base, actually. But uh, people kind of liked that. People People like the idea of the sinner redeemed. And so uh, uh, this was really who he was. His father probably, you know, never had more than a martini or something, and he was this supposedly reckless character. Uh, and supposedly there, were, there was a rift between the two of them. And, and you may remember that the Iraq War was sort of sold as a rift between them, that the father was against this and so on. One of the most staggering things that I discovered in researching this book was that this rift was manufactured, and that it was deliberately manufactured because they knew the father had lost and the son could not win playing by the same uh, uh, set of, uh, uh, of guidelines, let's say, characteristics. Uh, and so um, uh, I actually interviewed enough of the insiders to start piecing together. None of them seemed to have the whole picture because the Bush family is so secretive. But that this was, in fact, a very deliberate effort to uh, create this idea of a division and create the idea of the old Bush and the new Bush. Anyway, as I began looking at the father, uh, one of the things, uh, well, let, let me go back and say, as I began looking at the son, one of the things that struck me was I started looking at certain business ventures of his. And if we have time, I'll read you a little bit about those business ventures. But what I found interesting was that none of them made any sense. Uh, none of these companies made any money. Uh, and yet the money kept pouring in. And one fellow who came in with a million dollars when they needed it badly, the lawyer said to him, I need to uh, read you your rights here and the risks involved. He said, oh, it doesn't matter. It's not my money anyway. Um, and you'll see in the book that I think I figured out whose money it was. And uh, these, are, these are foreign powers uh, is, is whose money it seems to be. Uh, so all of his businesses, they don't make any money, uh, and then another business takes it over. That doesn't make any money. And every one of these businesses has this, what, what looked to me, and I showed it to friends of mine who cover Intel, it looks to be some kind of an intelligence uh, overlay, some kind of, I don't know what it is, there's money coming in from the Philippines and uh, the Saudis and uh, South Africa, Swiss bank accounts, you know, uh, offshore, the Caribbean, and, and they just don't make any sense. And so I said, I wonder what that's about. What, it almost looks like George W. Bush was connected to the spy world, but that seems crazy because who could imagine him being, you know, anything but Inspector Clouseau? Uh, uh, and so I, I began to wonder about that. What did that mean? But then you see, I began looking at the father. And that's when I discovered that the father had a secret life. When Joseph McBride came upon the document about George H.W. Bush's double life, he was not looking for it. It was 1985, and McBride, a writer for Daily Variety, was in a public library in the San Bernardino Mountains researching a book about the movie director Frank Capra. Like many good reporters, McBride took off on a slight, if time-consuming, tangent, spending day after day poring over reels of microfilm documents related to the FBI and the JFK assassination. McBride had been a volunteer on Kennedy's campaign and since 1963 had been intrigued by the unanswered questions surrounding that most singular of American tragedies. A particular memo caught his eye and he leaned in for a closer look. Practically jumping off the screen was a memorandum from FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover dated November 29, 1963. Under the subject heading, Assassination of President John F. Kennedy, Hoover reported that on the day after JFK's murder, the Bureau had provided two individuals with briefings. One was Captain William Edwards of the Defense Intelligence Agency. The other, Mr. George Bush of the Central Intelligence Agency.